this week, our first COVID cancellation after almost three years, which means we have to come up with a topic. So we're going to discuss the impact of chat GPT and AI on cybersecurity. In the leadership and communication section, leaders are feeling the pressure of an uncertain dynamic risk landscape. Gartner predicts nearly half of cybersecurity leaders will change jobs by 2025. How to empower teams and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Managing and protecting the world's grueling number of endpoints, enabling Tanium's customers to see, control, and protect every endpoint everywhere. Tanium's mission is to provide certainty in uncertain times with the industry's only converged endpoint management. Trusted by the U.S. military and the majority of the Fortune 100, today, Tanium helps manage and protect nearly 30 million endpoints. Tanium, the power of certainty. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Tanium to learn more. How is your business staying one step ahead of cyber criminals? Secure your email, applications, network, and data with Barracuda. Protect your business and go from zero to security in no time flat. Whether your team is working in one location or many, Barracuda has solutions that are easy to buy, deploy, and use. Learn how Barracuda can protect your business against ransomware, phishing, and other cyber attacks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Barracuda, your journey secured. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 295, recorded February 27th, 2023. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Today, it is a cast of business security folks. Uh, joining remotely first, my first co-host, Mr. Jason Albuquerque. Hey, Jason. What's going on, Matt? How are you? I'm, uh, I'm good. talking for about uh, five, six, seven inches of snow here overnight. So Ooh. it's one of the first. It's one of the first snows of the year, though. I mean, we haven't had anything major in New England, so yeah, that's we're good. We're starting Why to warm back up. February, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Of course. If I were still in Colorado, there'd be three more months of snow left. But right. here, I think we're done with it in Texas, so I think we're good. Also joining remotely, my other co-host, Mr. Tyler Robinson. How's Idaho, sir? Uh, you know, we're on fifth winter, of course. Like I, You have tile outside, so you wouldn't know anything about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And joining from the Security Weekly uh, crew, Mr. Adrian Sanabria. Thanks, Adrian, for joining. Yeah, sure. We're, we're on second spring, and the, uh, oh, the pollen's trying to kill me. Actively, actively trying to kill me. It's malicious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, allergy season is, is upon us, right? Don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. All right. Now, normally I had an interview scheduled for today. Uh, we were going to talk security ambassadors and security ambassador program. We'll get that rescheduled. Unfortunately, she got sick and, and had to cancel yesterday. So, that means we get to come up with a topic on the fly. And I thought, there's so much news right now about chat GPT and the chat bot and its impact on cybersecurity. It's like doomsday on both sides, right? One side of the fence is like, it's going to help us be better at, at protecting against adversaries. On the other side, it's it's only going to make adversaries even harder to defend against. And it's there's a lot of FUD on both sides. And I thought... Let's bring a group of folks together. And like, what what is the impact of this? Is there, one is there an impact? Number two, if there is, how should we think about it? And what do security leaders need to know? Because there, like I said, there is a lot of fud out there right now, and I'm worried that people are going to jump to conclusions or jump to go to do something that just may not make sense at this point. So, I want to start with Jason because Jason, you're kind of on the ground. Um, on a daily basis from an operational perspective. What what have you been hearing about chat GPT and this new AI capability and, and, and what it means for, for security? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can I can speak from um, day-to-day use, right? I mean, the teams are using it for operational efficiencies right now. 
And they're having some success. Honestly, they really, really are. Right. Um, it's helping them uh, get to information faster. It's helping them, uh, you know, coordinate information better. Uh, it's bringing, uh, you know, research time down a whole hell of a lot. And, and, and obviously, you know, we're, we're trusting but verifying. So the team's been doing a good job, you know, verifying accuracy and things of that nature. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we, we're tinkerers. So we try to push it to the limits, right? We do things like Dan and Dude, I don't know if you guys have seen that, do anything now, right? And, and, and really start putting in there um, some text to see if we can get chat GPT to bypass its content filters and content controls and, and really put, you know, really test the limit. So, I mean, we're using it, but again, trust, but verify. Yeah. I think, I think the other part, we really do have to distinguish the fact that there are, there's been a lot of other players in the game doing things like chat GPT and leveraging them without some of the constraints and boundaries that have uh, now had to go into chat GPT because it's been open to the public. It's, been very dynamic the the data set and the way that they're doing their training models those all play into kind of how they have to put boundaries and, and limitations around it. other other companies like uh, Aiden Technologies they're leveraging it solely for cybersecurity and, and the response capabilities and so when you're looking at from a leadership standpoint when you're looking at evaluating some of the AI platforms and ML like there are some very specific ones that could provide a lot of value without a lot of the risk that you're going to see uh, coming out with chat GPT. Well, that has some serious capabilities because it's massive. The, the platform and model has been trained very well and the public's using the crap out of it. Um, you know, at almost a hundred thousand dollars a day, it's a very expensive platform, but it's not very well tailored. It's a, it's a much broader uh, AI platform that doesn't deliver as much strategic advantage as some of the others do. But where do you see the future of that? Because I mean, think about it. Microsoft's already throwing their hat in the ring there, right? Yep. Integrations with Bing. You know, do do you see that becoming more of a an enterprise level um, platform at that point? Will Will they be maturing it to that level, or would you think it'll always stay that more open platform? I think it's going to very quickly turn into something that is one monetized and two that plays into multiple verticals at the same time. Very similar to how Google Search. And some of the internal search capabilities or the, the search backend API for, you know, searching your own stuff. Like, I think that same kind of model is going to apply to AI. And then there's going to be some very specific use cases where you're going to have some tailored solutions. Uh, and, and even maybe chat GPT is going to open up specific APIs and different uh, model and training sets specific to use cases. I think there's a ton of use cases we've not even scratched the surface on as far as efficiency and re and removing a lot of what we've thought about over the the uh, the coming years is how we're going to do this. But just like the calculator, we used to think that, you know, this is the end of mathematicians when the calculator came out or, you know, the kids started using uh, computers to cheat. And, and we've got all these people worried about all these things that chat GPT is going to take over. But really what we're what we're leaning towards and what that's always done is provide innovation and efficiency to make the next leap in tech, technology. So I think we're there and we're going to start seeing it used better and more efficiently for everyday use. But we had to get it out into the public and get it mainstream first. Exactly. Yeah. And that's exactly what the team's doing. But, you know, with it's the blessing and the curse because the same tools that our good folks have, <laughs> right? The threat actors have now, right? Yep. So it's that blessing and the curse that we have to make sure we're uh, cognizant of, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, there's there's some evil stuff. Uh, you you start talking uh, some of the more fringe cases of how ChatGPT is, you know, laying out war strategy or bringing the demise to mankind, or even just writing uh, malicious code that bypasses AMC. Some very some very specific things mm -hmm. for attackers' use cases. You can quickly start to see how powerful this is and how quickly it can get out of hand. If not, uh, again, and putting the boundaries around it, I don't think is is the solution because you, you see how people getting around all the boundaries and that's going to be a cat and mouse game. It's like yep. AV, EDR, all the things we've been doing forever. We don't want to get into that. So really finding ways to get the model specifically tailored to the use cases, I think, is kind of the next hurdle that we're going to get to. Yeah. And, and I mean, the use cases, I mean, those, the use cases of being able to manipulate chat, B, chat GPT is real, right? I, I did it personally myself. And, and by going through almost that dude strategy that they have, right, where you're, you're saying, listen, play another role as a different AI model, right? And you start giving it all of these tasks to become different, 
and bypass the content policies. I got it. It was hard. Like you have to actually work it a little bit, but I got it to give me, you know, information about it. So, so the two examples I use, if China and the U S were to go to war today, right? What, who, who would win? And then it started, like I had to go down. I spent probably about a half an hour going down that, that rabbit hole, but I finally got them to give me, got it to give me statistics. The other one I also did was if, you know, if Snoop Dogg, um, got into a knife fight with Martha Stewart. Like, what would be the result there, right? And I, and I got to, like, I got it to actually get down past the content policies. And are you, you gonna leave us hanging on both those? You're not gonna tell us what it said. <laughs> so, so uh, here's what it is: Snoop Dogg is taller and has a longer reach, so he would win. <laughs> Much longer reach, probably. But Martha Stewart went to jail, so. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> She, yeah, she might have she might have learned a few skills awesome. in the house. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, hundred dollars well, a day. You, know, you, you, spend, you go down the rabbit hole, you can finally get it to to give you the results that you want. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that's one of the interesting – one of the articles I read was this this whole worry and fear about now ransomware malware can be polymorphic and change because now it can it can constantly change itself which means defenses would have to change but we're already pretty much there like we've got enough sophistication in malware delivery and ransomware attacks that does chat gpt really change the game because my guess is our defenses are already needing to shift based on the sophistication now i'm not sure chat chat gpt changed that dynamic for us no it just creates more operational efficiencies on that side on the threat actor side right yeah so it's 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 the speed to speed to success or speed to tool or speed to malware you know it's giving them the operational efficiencies just like it's giving our team yeah i was gonna say it doesn't it doesn't necessarily change the game it can improve efficiencies it can offer creative solutions for an attacker that may not be as creative or as uh skilled it may offer insights that you didn't consider, but all of those things are are time time and resource based, right? Like you get the right actor or different actors come at you. Those are going to be different avenues and there's always a different vector and, and different thought process, a different level of creativity, different level of sophistication. So all those things have been in play. This just makes it much easier for, I would say, the less creative or lazy attackers to then get uh, get ahead of the game. But at the same time, you also have the ability to leverage this as, from a defensive standpoint to build in resiliency. Think of strategies that you didn't consider from a defensive standpoint if you're using this correctly. So everybody's focused on this offensive side. You start asking it some very strategic defensive questions on prioritization and how to begin to mitigate risk given uh, this complex equation. You have to step through it, and it's a very – uh, logic-based and laborious task, but you're essentially doing program ladder la uh, logic, uh, ladder logic, and getting to something that you don't have to come to on your own. You've got a computer to go through those models and, and very quickly identify those. So it, it makes it very efficient from the brain computing power you're not having to exert to get to the same answer you probably would get to anyway. Yeah, the the fear that I have, guys, is that our teams become complacent on this. Like mm, I, yeah. the, the day I fear is when we have teams saying, you know, write me secure code for X, Y, Z, and they trust it. Yeah. I started this off with trust, but verify, right? You know, that's my fear. And, and I mean, Cornell came out with a, the, a study, I think it was late last year, November, December last year, that showed that coders who used AI assistance in developing code were actually developed less secure code. Yes. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I'm afraid that that's going to be a crutch, right? And I don't want to allow it to be a crutch. You know, you, you mentioned it, Tyler, you know, the lazy threat actors, right? But w we don't want complacency on the good guys, right? We don't want our teams becoming complacent and, and having thinking they have that easy button. Well, I, I think it's important for everyone using these tools to understand the limitations, you know, and, and like, first off, you know, the data is old. Data is a couple years old. So yes. if you're going to try and ask it, you know, how many acquisitions does Cisco have or whatever, like, like it's going to cut off at 2021 and, and, and you're not going to get an accurate answer. And, and then also, uh, you know, I don't know all the details. I, I don't think we publicly know what data it's trained on, but I'm pretty sure when they train it, it doesn't know the difference between a good answer and a bad answer. 
is just like a parrot. It just repeats stuff that it's heard, you know? So, you know, on Stack Exchange, uh, you know, it would be great if it was smart enough to distinguish the green check answer from all the ones that were downvoted or, you know, same thing on Reddit, you know, the... <laughs> It would be it would be great right. if we knew that it was trained on the good answers versus the bad because on a lot of these sites that it's probably scraping and training on, uh, there is some way to distinguish good from bad, but uh, it's not going to be efficient for them to cherry pick that data as they train these things. So I've done some tests on this. It will absolutely spit out fake stats, you know, known myths mm -hmm. and lies. Uh, you you have to be very aware that. It's it's happy to throw that stuff out there. It'll insist it's correct, also. <laughs> well, that's that's the yeah. part that and, and, carries and, and, the uneducated or un. I would I would say the the people that trust this because they just don't know, right? They're going to assume this code is secure, or they're going to assume this answer is correct. It's like the general populace of eighty percent of people that that just assume the news is correct or, or assume whatever they're reading on Facebook is, is accurate. That's that's the level that I think we're now having to contend with on something that is spitting out and being a definitive answer. And I'm worried we're going to see companies start to pop up, well, outsource companies for coding, overseas companies that have automated the integration of this and then start pushing code out for uh, development pipelines uh, because they think it is, it is yeah. accurate, it saves money, and it is very time efficient uh, from a cost saving standpoint, but we're going to end up with really bad code. We already have bad code, and yeah. that's from intelligent if, people doing bad code. If only there could be the equivalent of a watermark that would tell you, you know, this code or this text generated by chat GPT and you, oh, okay. And it's okay, getting I, harder and harder for, to for, and Adrian, for everything, yeah. for everything. Listen, content online, how many people are going to use this as an easy button? Yeah. Because they already, they're lazy and they don't want to do the research are. to write content online. Then get that published. And there's no gut check whether or not it was completely written by yeah. chat GPT. That's dangerous. Do you know what teachers because are going through right now? Feeding, oh. We're now <laughs> are feeding the fake news, right? Yeah. Yeah. Teacher, yeah. Teachers are yeah. having a hard time right now. Yeah, you know, they, they don't know what to do with this. Well, and that's yeah. that. Well, I know school districts are banning it in certain areas. <laughs> yeah. I saw one article where a publishing firm laid off 12% of their writing staff because they're going to use this as a way to replace them. And their stock jumped like 155%. But how good is that writing going to be? Back to oh, your it's point, already Jason, terrible. Right? Trust, but verify. It'd probably be better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of the stuff right. I've read up. And, and I mean, they are yeah. coming now. I don't know how. I don't know how good the tools are, but there, there are AI content detectors that are that are detecting Chat GPT content, and it will literally give you a percentage. I, I've tried it a couple of times. It seemed pretty good, but I haven't done enough. You know, what I mean, I haven't put enough through it to to, to know. But um, it'll give you a percentage on whether or not it was human generated content or not. See, that's so that's this is the, fifty percent generated. That's the hard part because then you you start to get into that cat cat and mouse game again because you can actually tell Chat GPT to output something that does not have detection capabilities for itself, and it is aware on like what is being detected in certain cases depending on what code you're you're generating. But we also go back to in today's day, day and age, like plagiarism is very difficult because there's so much content being pushed out. And so much of it is very similar, unless you're in a very distinct. <laughs> it, it, it's like a Tumblr. Way. It's like a Tumblr yeah, you, uh, for, you really, for plagiarism. Even if you're not plagiarizing, you're still repeating content because of how much is out there, and there's no good way to detect it. This is just adding to that noise, it's, it, and that noise is getting horrible. It, it's like laundering money, but for English essays. <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, there's Instagram accounts and, and TikTok accounts that are just taking other people's videos, doing a watch, putting some words over it, adding a, yeah. whatever catchy tune has the best algorithm. And ChatGPT is doing that automatically. They're making hundreds of thousand dollars a month. It's it's unreal. Like I feel like I feel like I should be doing this, but it just seems so dirty that you just can't, you can't bring yourself to do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just so dirty. And, dirty. and to be clear, I, I think there's some stuff that really needs to be some roles. Uh, like there's so much garbage content out there. Uh, honestly, I think a lot of stuff is going to be improved by firing whoever was was writing that content and uh, and replacing them with uh, with an AI bot. But uh, but yeah, I, I think you know going back to the beginning to what Jason was saying, it, it's best to think of it as an assistant at this point and and maybe stay away from facts. <laughs> like exactly. it's it, it's great when you're staring Trust at a blank sheet of paper and. and uh, you need it to get you started. In fact, I've got AI built into uh, Notion here, and I've been playing with it. Hmm. And and 
like just preparing for this podcast, literally it needs five seconds to give me like, like a great starting point. Like I just asked it, what is chat GPT good for? What, what are good chat GPT use cases? And the output is great. Hmm. And, and that's notion telling me about chat GPT. Uh, I tried to get it to tell me which one is better uh, and it refused. To, to yeah. comment, oh, funny. One of the one of the things I am so worried a, about is is the creativity loss that and our ability to do that creative thinking on our own and the tenacity. Like we we've, we've been saying, this is a problem in the security industry for a little while, right? Like the level it took most of us to come up through the ranks, help desk, sysadmin, the the hard work, tenacity that kind of got us to where we're at, and, and being able to problem solve and continually learn. Like this next generation, they don't have the time to sacrifice to do all that, but they still need those skills to be effective. And we're losing some of that, that skill base and that uh, tenacity and hard work. And I think this is going to make that exacerbated and, and continue that process thus to the point where either we have such a huge disting distinguishing factor or base from really good people that are doing those things and those that are using this, or it's going to be so noisy that you're just not going to be able to tell who's good and who's not. And that's going to, that's already kind of been a problem with interviewing and hiring and all the other stuff that we have in the well, industry. And using these tools is a skill in itself though. It you is. Know, uh, um, what do they call them? Prompt engineers. Uh, it, it's what really a thing. If you look at, <laughs> yeah, prompt engineer. Yeah. yeah. Prompt engineering, like learning what to tell these AIs. And, and honestly, like when you start with one, uh, there's, there's all these steps that prompt engineers will go through, uh, to prep it. Like basically they'll, they'll tell it you're bad at math. Instead, you're going to use this bot and they'll connect it to another AI bot that's specifically set up for doing math. And it'll say, Hey, don't even try to do math yourself. You're terrible at it. Use this instead. If I ask you to, to do anything with math, you know, so there, there's this whole, like, like you can prep it. Uh, when you start using it, you know, to answer th things a certain way or to integrate other AI bots that are more specialized, it, it goes pretty deep. But, you know, you know, Adrian, to, to Tyler's point, you'll be able to pull that level of intellectual curiosity, you know, from the candidate as you're interviewing them to oh, know absolutely. that they have the skills to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think if anything, this strengthens the fact that we need those apprenticeship programs. Yeah. So we can bring folks in and bring them up in in the way of the organization, right? In the way of uh, having that intellectual curiosity, being able to go down that 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 rabbit hole of, of an investigation, right? Yeah. And really, really dig deep and not use the easy buttons. We have to be taking this next generation of workforce and bringing them through that apprenticeship program to show them the way. And honestly, they need to use the easy buttons when it's the time and place to use them. When it's appropriate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's, it's almost as bad to refuse to use this technology when, sure. when you know, it can help Agreed. the business, when it can increase uh, use of time and efficiency. So, yeah. yeah. And, and that's where we come in as leaders, right? Helping them find that balance. Mm -hmm. Because again, I'm afraid the pendulum is going to swing and it's going to be easy button after easy button oh, after easy for button. For some people, but dangerous. some people have always looked for the easy buttons. Like, yeah. like different tools, you know, same psychology, same personality types sure. and stuff like that, that you got to work. It's getting with. harder to pick it out though, Adrian, is my point. Yeah. <laughs> not, well, not when you talk to the person though. That, that's that's yeah. where we, we got to keep, uh, you know, it, it's still good to meet with people face to face. It's still good to, you know, you know, maybe not always interact over Slack. You know, it could be a bot you're talking to in the future. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, you never know. You do the entire interview via some mechanism that's not online. You could probably be fooled by a bot in, in making it look like a real person. To, then out you're hiring a bot instead of a, a real person. So. A guy at Vice or Motherboard did that. He actually set up, um, like he pre-recorded video prompts, like, you know, common answers to questions and stuff like that. And he used AI to determine when to use those different video responses when, when somebody asks him a question and he spent a whole week doing that. And at the end of the week, he told his, his coworkers, uh, all, all journalists, right. You know, so they, they love to play around with stuff like this. Uh, and, and most of them had no idea, but that, that might say wow. st something more about the value of their meetings than the value of his, <laughs> <laughs> how pointless their meetings are, not, not how, how good the AI is. Right. Yeah. I mean, I now, Adrian, you track. Oh, sorry, 
Tyler. I was going to ask no, Adrian no, a quick question because you've been tracking a lot of the startups, a lot of the funding announcements, new product announcements. How, I mean, are there a lot of funding around leveraging some of these technologies? And are there like pure play AI companies? Is AI now a subset? Because I know Checkpoint and Orca Security and a few others have embedded chat GPT capabilities into their products. But is there a whole new like company that's just, they're all they're focused on is the AI that that others are going to use in this space. Yeah, yeah, we're going to see those, but they're all in stealth right now. You know, we're, we're they're they're not yeah. out in the open yet. But uh, you can be assured that uh, domain registration with domains with uh, AI TLD is is spiking right now. <laughs> it's on the rise. Well, it's been, um, so yeah, it's been happening for a while, right? Yeah, it's been happening for a while, but. Um, yeah, MLAI's been a buzzword in security for a while, but these this generative uh, generative uh, AI that's benefited from uh, I forget what it was called. Google made some breakthrough in 2017, 2018. Or the that hash really, yeah, yeah, the that, that the outcomes. Yeah, that that lit all this on fire. You know, some kind of ladder. Like I, I forget how they describe it, but uh, but basically these things, these generative AI. Like with the language stuff, it's just t determining what's the next best word to put here. That's how it's thinking. What's the next best word to put here? What's the next best word to put here? Like it's really dumb when you understand how the how the algorithm works. Like it, it's not thinking. You know, this is just uh, it, it's a very narrow AI that's just been trained on this huge data set. And like I said, it's a parrot. Like a parrot doesn't know what it's saying. It's just repeating stuff it's heard. But um, but yeah, no, we haven't seen the impact from like the chat GPT, you know, the generative uh, type tools yet, except in a couple of cases where uh, vendors are using it to auto-generate content and, and, and things like that. Yeah, our customers have asked, like, we'd be curious what would happen if you took something like chat GPT, put it over all the data we collect and at, actually make recommendations off of it. I could see some value there, right? And I think that's what Orca Security did. I think Orca pointed it at all of its data and basically asked it like based on this data what would you do it, it'll with, do a good job know, what would that, you do I think. Yeah. yeah yeah so prioritization and recommendations maybe uh i mean we're already using ml for prioritization if you look at mm -hmm. you know vulnerability yep. uh management and things like that but um i mean i think the biggest impact to to security vendors and just vendors in general is like customer success and support when you have questions about a product like, like pump the whole knowledge base, train it on the knowledge base and all the facts and stuff like that, build that into the software, like huge savings in customer success and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and support folks. Yeah. Taking, taking some of those level one questions, mm -hmm. those tier one questions and being able to self-serve. Yeah. Cause just yeah. getting to a human is so painful, you know, in, in many cases it, it's intentionally made, made painful, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more excited about it from that standpoint. Products will be, better to use, you know, will be a better experience for customers from that standpoint. And that's just not a security specific thing. Um, but yeah, certainly applications that are knowledge based, you know, I mean, we collect so much data in security, you know, the ability mm -hmm. to ask questions about that data is, is pretty huge. So, well, the, the fear for, so security the fear analytics, how do, you, yeah. how do you poison, how do you poison the knowledge base? So that's, that's right. one of the yeah, things that, that, that we're, we were working on for a couple startups is now that we've got, you know, these AI backends and APIs and things and, and data sets and, and learning models, what's the security implication to a company that puts us into their product or leverages an API? Can I taint the data set? Does the training model, can it be, um, have code execution with inside of it? Can I have that model actually output things that are representations that, can taint uh, the brand or value within a market. There's all kinds of stuff that we're working on. And, and so there's whole AI security companies that are being built and, and in stealth mode right now that will put a AI protection in front of your model or your access to the AI that gets output. So you, you've got a whole other security vertical now that is even being uh, stood up that, that we have to consider from a, from a risk-based standpoint. We've got one more product going into our network one more avenue and vector for attackers to attack and then leverage. So again, this whole cat and mouse game is not over. Potentially hundreds more, Tyler, yeah. because if every one of your every one of your partners is using their own AI, 
Now you have hundreds. Yeah. Right? Like a new SaaS, app, like a new SaaS application. Uh, imagine that, <laughs> Imagine you have a SOAR tool automatically taking an action based on the output mm -hmm. of an AI, right. and, and you're able to poison it, you know, and it connects to the IP address that I want it to connect to, right? Like, right. yeah, there, there's, it. we almost need like a certification program, you know, or, or some kind of framework to, and I know people are, are working on a bunch of things here uh, to understand what types of data are safe versus not safe uh, to, to trust as output uh, from these things. What can be poisoned, what, what can't be? Like, if I need to get started on a blog post, like it's really hard to poison that, right? Like <laughs> it's, you know, but if I'm asking it again for facts, anything factual can be tainted, can be misinformation, yep. misinformation. Yeah. And then, then wrong IP into, address. Yeah. Yeah. You run into the, the other problem. The reason this is so difficult to do because the understanding of how AI and ML actually works from a mathematical standpoint and, and even training models and the languages being used. Those are data scientists. Those are mathematicians. Those are not security professionals or even IT. They do have very technical backgrounds, but they're very technical in a, in a vertical that has not had to deal with some of security implications. And so we're now having to train an entire uh, very intelligent group of technical people in their own respect, the security implications and trying to merge that into higher math and higher understandings of, of data and models that, that we as security professionals have no understanding of yeah, and yeah. is taking a lot longer a good point. to get up to speed with. So it's we're going to have a I, big gap there. A, a retired CISO I talked to uh, a couple days ago, we're, we're actually going to interview him on, uh, on ESW, uh, was telling me that uh, he, he really strongly believes in this might be uh, you know, the, the crux of the, the interview, you know, that all security teams need data science, need somebody with that, with mm -hmm. that kind of skill set. And I, I can see, you know, training AI, prompt engineering, that type of thing being folded into that same role. Yeah, it's going to open up some new interesting roles, which is only going to make uh, the whole skills gap issue in our industry even worse because we have data scientists on staff here at Living Security to to, they're hard to, to, get. to fine tune our models. Yeah. They're hard to find and they're not cheap. But like these guys no. are expensive for really good ones and they're really hard to find. That just adds a whole new burden of staffing that CISOs now have to deal with above and beyond the skill gaps they already have. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, we could probably go on forever, but I'm going to wrap this one, keep us uh, somewhat on time. Um, we're going to take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. <laughs> 